Okay, welcome to the first in the obstructive disorders uh, presentation. So let's go ahead and start with this one. We'll start with chronic bronchitis, then we'll go to uh, emphysema, and then we'll go to COPD, which is a combination of both chronic bronchitis and emphysema. And usually chronic bronchitis is what causes emphysema, and there's a lot of similarities there. So we'll start here with chronic bronchitis. And uh, in my book, it's chapter 12 of Disjardin's Your Disease book. Uh, so there's some tables in there that are going to be useful. Um, I do have tables uploaded to Blackboard uh, that I suggest that you fill out to help sort of differentiate uh, between the different diseases uh, that you will see. So a lot of the COPD uh, disease processes, a lot of the obstructive disease processes, and just like the restrictive processes, tend to run together in certain areas. And so that's why I want you to create those charts. Now I have the the, the blank for you on on uh, your blackboard, so that way you could start filling it out so you could see the minute differences between things like chronic bronchitis and emphysema and why you might treat one with more mucolytic therapies and the other one you would treat more with hyperinflation therapy or CPAP or right so we got to know the slight differences between these these processes because it's going to help you make clinical decisions as we go and that's why those charts are going to help you see the minute differences between these obstructive disorders we don't treat all obstructive disorders the same way with chronic bronchitis these patients are going to have lots and lots of secretions with emphysema hardly any secretions it's usually more of a dry white secretion and if they have it so we're not going to treat them the same way but they're both obstructive disorders so that's why i want you guys to sort of get this down see the difference between the two that's going to help you be that much better of a bedside provider down the road for these patients and that's our end game I want to help you guys get the highest quality of care to the patients out there uh, chronic bronchitis right here it says uh, blue bloater uh, you see it down here right under the chapter 12 blue bloater uh, these patients tend to be a little bit on the uh, uh, more significant body habitus side as well as uh, they tend to be more cyanotic and hypoxic with with chronic bronchitis and so one of the terms that they use is blue bloater so if you see that out there I'm not saying it's good or bad uh, it's just one of the things they're using to describe chronic bronchitis there's still a lot of um, generationally advanced uh, respiratory therapies out there therapists out there that refer to these patients as blue bloaters so that way if you hear this you sort of know what they're talking about all right so these are your obstructive diseases uh your obstructive diseases that are more common out there um and this is what we'll be talking about today so chronic bronchitis emphysema and asthma you could see uh here there's a lot of stuff that shares commonalities between these um, and so you're going to see some overlap and that's one of the things I want you to pay attention to that's why I want you to do that chart that's what I want you to see in there I want you to see the differences and what makes emphysema emphysema what makes chronic bronchitis chronic bronchitis what makes asthma different from emphysema what makes asthma different from chronic bronchitis right so you sort of see that there's going to be some stuff that that crosses over but I need you to see the minute differences because it's those differences that's going to really help you when it gets down to patient care. Uh, cystic, fibro cystic fibrosis and bronchiectasis will also have presentations on as well but most commonly you're going to be seeing unless you work in a specialty area this sort of triad of issues with your patients and a lot of these patients with emphysema and chronic bronchitis come in with infections asthma we'll talk about different types of asthma that go in there too but someone with emphysema can also have airway reversibility which is asthma right and so we can have issues where someone already has chronic bronchitis and they have emphysema and they have an asthma component to their process so now you're going to have to be treating all three of these so you got to be aware of what's going on here so all obstructive diseases are done to what we call CBABE CF so CBABE is chronic bronchitis asthma bronchiectasis 
emphysema, and then cystic fibrosis. So if we're looking at obstructive diseases that are out there, CBABE CF, right? So you, I'm not probably the first person to come up with this. This is something that was taught to me years and years ago. So if in a condition is not one of the CBABE CFs, if it's not one of the ones on the screen, and you are asked about how to look at this patient, whether they're obstructive or restrictive, if their condition is not in the CBABE CF, in general, it's most likely restrictive, which means low volumes, right? When we talked pulmonary function testing, we talked about restrictives, like someone bear hugging and squeezing someone's chest, so they can't, it's restricting them from taking a deep breath in. So an obstructive disease is, remember, they can't flow. They're, they're, they can't blow out very well at all. There's something obstructing their airways from flowing out. It's like going from a four lane highway to a two lane highway. Something's obstructing that flow from coming out of their lungs. And so CBABE CF is gonna be all your low flow. So low flow rates. It's supposed to be the flow symbol. Not very good at this drawing on the computer thing. All right, low flow rates. So that's one of the things that you gotta remember. If it's one of the CBABE CFs, we're looking at low flow rates. If it's not one of these, we're looking at low volumes, which would be your, your restrictive process. So these are all going to be obstructive to start with, so we're looking at low flow rates on their pulmonary function testing. So chronic bronchitis, this is the first one. As you can see with chronic bronchitis, we're going to have issues with, um, we're gonna have enlarged um, mucus glands, we're gonna have uh, smooth muscle contraction, we're going to have mucus plugging, we're going to have a mucus accumulation of course, and then um, we're going to have lots of issues, and these patients usually have chronic infections that's causing their issue. So that's one of the things that we're going to have to deal with when we're looking at this whole chronic bronchitis thing. There's something that's causing them to have this inflammation, right? Itis is inflammation. So there's something that's causing them to have that over on. So we just need to be aware of what their exposure is, what they're looking at, right? So mucus accumulation, um, enlarged submucosal glands, um, and then I think this is inflammation of the epithelium here, right? Inflammation of the epithelium. And that's one of the reasons why you'll see chronic bronchitis, they'll use inhaled corticosteroids for primary treatment on this. So they'll order Symbicorts or they'll order um, Flovens, they'll order QVARs, right? They'll order some of those treatments for it as well as mucus accumulation, smooth muscle contraction as well as mucus plugging. So there's a lot of therapies that we'll talk about associated with this, but this is everything that's going on here is what's going on in their lungs. So this is a lot of stuff and it can be a lot for their body to handle, especially over time. Um, oh, H -A, <laughs> sorry, HALV here is hyperinflation of the alveoli, what happens, right, you have that smooth muscle that constricts, so gas can flow in, but when you exhale, what happens to your airways? They get smaller. They get smaller, and with this smooth muscle constriction, with mucus plugging, with all this stuff, you're going to trap a bunch of gas back behind it in your alveoli. So there's a lot of issues. That's why this can be hyperinflation. Uh, and cause lung damage, especially long-term damage, if they keep on having their chronic bronchitis year after year. So it can be pretty damaging overall. So that's that hyperinflation of the alveoli. All right, alterations associated with chronic bronchitis. I will ask you this later. It is defined. Notice that this is in bold. It is a definition, <laughs> which means you will be responsible for it, yay. Uh, it's defined as clinically and chronic productive cough for three months, I would, you do need to remember these numbers, in each of two successive years, right? Two successive years with a productive cough, other causes had been excluded. So we excluded things like lung cancer, we've excluded 
other reasons why they might have a cough reflex, right? We've, we've excluded other things. So three consecutive months for two consecutive years. If they have a lot of mucus production for three consecutive months for two consecutive years, that's going to be chronic bronchitis. So what goes on with chronic bronchitis? Well, we already looked at this at the last screen. Like I said, repetition is the key to learning. And so here you go. Chronic inflammation, right? You're going to have that swelling, that inflammation that thickens the airway's walls. According to Posey's law, as the walls get thicker, the airway, the lumen will get smaller, which makes it harder for them to get gas in and gas out of their lungs, so they have to work harder to breathe. Uh, excessive mucus production. There's something going on, uh, some sort of irritation that's causing mucus to accumulate. Because remember, mucus is a protective agent. It's going to encaseate and trap or remove foreign things that go into your lungs. It encaseates it. It makes mucus in order for you to trap it and move it out so it doesn't stay in your lungs. So something's causing that irritation in your once your lungs notice that there's irritation and inflammation, they're going to start producing more and more mucus, right? So as you produce more and more of this mucus, your mu you're going to actually have partial or total plugging of the airways, right? So that's going to be something big to look at because once we get really, really thick, tenacious, thick mucus, at some point your cilia is going to be like, I cannot handle this amount of mucus. It wasn't created to have this amount of mucus. It wasn't designed to handle this much amount of mucus. So some of that mucus is going to stay behind and clog up the airways. Yeah not great. Uh, you're going to have, like we talked about before, smooth muscle constriction. So the bronchial airways, you're going to have bronchospasm as part of this as well. This is variable. Some of these patients will have uh, low flow rates, but they won't have, they won't be reactive to albuterol. So let's do a pulmonary function test on this patient. So let's do um, a peak flow, right? So we have this patient do a peak flow meter, right? They do the peak flow meter. We give them an albuterol nebulizer. We wait 10 to 15 minutes for it to really kick in. And then we have them do the peak flow meter again, right? We don't see a difference in their flow rates. And that might be because it, they might not have smooth muscle constriction with their version of it. They might just have the inflammation that's causing the low flow rates, right? The inflammation's making it so the, the airway is that much smaller. And so that's why we're having issues with their flow rates. It might not be reversible with albuterol. And that's okay. That just means that it's the inflammation that's causing most of their flow rate issue, not inflammation with bronchospasm. So that's something we got to be aware of. Now, bronchospasm, like I said, is variable finding. They could have it. They could not have it. But remember, we have mucus accumulation and chronic inflammation. Well, will something a beta sympathomimetic uh, like albuterol help ciliary motility? Absolutely, there are studies to support that. So you will be giving nebulizers to these patients that are bronchodilators, even though the patient doesn't have bronchospasm. You're not giving it for bronchospasm. You are giving it for airway clearance therapy. There are so many RTs out there that do not understand this. You are giving it for airway clearance therapy because these drugs that we're giving that are also used for bronchospasm, they improve ciliary motility. What's the big issue here? Look at number three, plugging and excessive mucus here. What do we want to get working more productive? The ciliary escalator. Okay, so next time you complain or hear an RT complain about giving a duoneb to someone that doesn't have bronchospasm, question yourself, is this partially because we want to increase airway clearance? So let's say someone went under general anesthesia and they were paralyzed, which means their cilia were also paralyzed, which means they're at a high risk for pneumonia because their cilia are paralyzed, they can't move stuff out of their lungs. And we're giving something that stimulates the cilia to help prevent a post-pulmonary infection, post-operative pulmonary infection. So think about this. Next time you hear an RT or next time you think, hear someone talk about giving a duoneb to someone that doesn't have bronchospasm, think about could this also be given 
because of the airway clearance therapy aspect of it. Just something that's out there, right? Something for your information. So because of the smaller lumen of the airway, right, we talked about this, air trapping is easily possible. Now this could even happen just with a massive amount of inflammation that happens with chronic bronchitis, right? Even if it doesn't cause bronchospasm, you're still making the lumen smaller. You're going from a bigger lumen to a smaller lumen. And that means that during exhalation, that lumen gets even smaller, and there's less gas that can come out, which leads to that hyperinflation. You will need to know these, right? These are sort of staples of this whole thing. Pathophysiology, this is where we're looking at the irritation and inflammation, most commonly due to smoking. Yeah. So this is most common on your smokers. Very, very common. Thing, uh, that irritation of the smoke and the everything that's in the cigarettes as well as the smoke uh, leads to hypertrophy of the mucus glands. So the mucus glands get bigger. Hyperplasia, that means we have an increase in number of mucus glands and goblet cells. And that means because we got an increase in size and number of mucus glands, we're going to secrete more mucus yay see how this all relates to secreting more mucus because there's so much irritation going on the lungs are like well we got to ramp up production of mucus to get rid of this and so it does that by making the glands larger as well as increasing the number of cells that way they can ramp up production to get rid of this so continued exposure can increase mucus plugging so there should be a thing back here can increase mucus plugging, right? It can increase mucus plugging and it decreases ciliary function, which will then also increase mucus plugging. So we have got a lot of stuff going on with this and cigarette smoking is the number one cause out there currently. Um, but it's mostly irritants, and one of the biggest irritants, especially for people that, uh, that are out there, is going to be smoking. Uh, atmospheric pollutions can also trigger this as well, uh, but we're going to primarily be looking at smokers here. As the disease progresses, the flow rates, so this is from a pulmonary function test, will continue to drop. So all the flow rates on your PFTs are going to be low. Right, so they're FEV 1%, right? All those flow rates, the peak expiratory flow rate, all these things are going to be low flow rates. Because there is mucus plugging, this will also lead to a VQ mismatch and hypoxemia. This is where they get that cyanosis. Uh, that's why they're called blue bloater because the cyanosis part of it. They're very cyanotic. Uh, we'll look at their hemodynamics and their CVPs and their pulmonary artery pressure will be high. That's why they have more common core pulmonale or right-sided heart failure issues uh, because they're looking at that hypoxic vasoconstriction in the lungs, which backs up pressure into the right side of the heart, which makes the heart hypertrophy right that's where you get that right-sided heart failure that's why their cvps their pulmonary artery pressures their right atrial pressures the right ventricle pressures all those things will be increased because they got that pulmonary vasoconstriction going on with hypoxemia that's why one of the first drugs you give for hypoxemia is oxygen what does the oxygen do to the the capillaries in your lungs well it vasodilates right and so that's going to help relieve that pulmonary hypertension or the pulmonary vasoconstriction. Uh, typically, these patients will hypoventilate. So what does that mean for their PaCO2? If they hypoventilate, that means their CO2 is going to be high, right? They're not ventilating well, right? They can't get rid of that gas. So their CO2 levels are going to be high. This leads to pulmonary vasoconstriction. High CO2 in your lungs leads to pulmonary vasoconstriction that will lead to pulmonary hypertension and ultimately lead to core pulmonale which is right-sided heart failure so here are slides that i took from your book i know i usually don't like to take slides from your book because 
Uh, I like to give you something else to look at, but these were actually done pretty well, so I like them a lot. Uh, let me pick a different color here. Let's go with yellow. All right, so here we're going to see uh, an increase in the amount of mucus production and the amount of goblet cells and everything going on. And also we're going to see a thickening of the alveolar or the lumen of the airway. Uh, so we're going to remember we have hypertrophy of the goblet cells and the mucus glands. And also we have uh, hyperplasia. And so this ultimately leads to an increased amount of mucus. And so as you can see, and you guys can read it as well in your book, it just gives you a good view of what is going on here. We have that increased thickness that's going on overall and we have this numerical value of increased goblet cells and mucosal production. Uh, it's pretty crazy and these patients usually produce a lot of sputum. Uh, one of the classic things I was taught uh, as a provider was to ask them uh, if they cough up when they're when they have issues going on uh, if they're coughing up more than a shot glass full a day and a lot of people are very familiar with shot glass volume in the adult world and so when you're doing this that would tell you that they're creating a lot of mucus they're producing a lot of mucus and that might tell us that airway clearance therapy might be something that would be beneficial for this patient so what does this patient look like at the bedside all right so the big thing that they might show up with is hypoxia right now if this is chronic bronchitis remember three consecutive months for two consecutive years. So that's what makes it chronic, right? That's the chronic part of chronic bronchitis. Now you can get bronchitis uh, for a couple months and then if you don't have it the next year, okay. But if you get bron bronchitis for three months this year and the next year you get it for three months, guess what you have? You're starting to have chronic bronchitis. And like I said, this is more common with people that smoke or have industrial exposure or some sort of fume or dust exposure can cause this as well, but we'll get into that in a bit. But the big thing is gonna be hypoxia. Now, if they do this for quite a while, they'll start to produce more red blood cells that would create polycythemia on their their um, their labs and so when we do their labs they may compensate with a little polycythemia here uh, but that's because it's a response to the hypoxemia right that's what's causing them to create more red blood cells their body their kidneys are sensing low oxygen levels the kidneys push in erythropoietin which then will produce more red blood cells so on and so forth uh, like I said here, the big thing is going to be coughing, but this is going to be lots of purulent sputum. Hopefully you know what the word purulent means. All right, lots of pus in the sputum. So that's going to be something that's going to be very common with these patients. Uh, it'll be pretty easy to get a sputum sample from them. Usually they are cough up lots and lots of thick, tenacious, purulent uh, sputum. Um, so we'll get that sometimes, send that to the lab. Depends on what the doctor wants to do with it. Breath sounds, if you listen to them at the bedside, you're going to hear things like wheezes and crackles. Uh, wheezes, you remember, is a constricted airway. It's just like a whistle. There's a constriction that causes a whistle as gas flows through it. So you're going to hear that wheezing. Uh, now, if the patient is only inflammation, they don't have the bronchospasm component, which some of them don't, uh, you still can hear wheezing because what's happened to the lumen, it got narrow, right? We had a big lumen and then it got smaller. And so that means that that's more likely to produce a wheeze, right? Or that whistle. And so you can still hear wheezing even if it's inflammation. So just be aware. Crackles because of all the sputum, right? Um, so you can hear those coarse <sighs> snoring crackles when you're listening to them. Some uh, practitioners will call it ronchi. Um, but you might hear crackles, uh, fine crackles as well, which would be like atelectasis from the mucus plugging. Um, so you'll have some of that that can be going on as well. Uh, these patients are more prone to respiratory infections because is their mucociliary escalator working well here? It is not, right? Their mucociliary escalator is slowed down. It's bogged down with thick, sticky mucus. So that means the stuff that's in their lungs 
has the ability to grow in a warm, dark, humid environment and fester. So these patients are very prone to things like pneumonia. So that's something that we got to be careful with on these patients too. Uh, they'll have a diminished or poor respiratory drive overall. It's going to be they're going to work pretty hard to breathe. Hypercapnia, which means their CO2 will be increased in late stages, right? In their late stages, they'll have that increased CO2 level. That's where it's not able to ventilate with the alveoli, right? Because of the mucus plugging, because of the inability to get gas out of their lungs. They're going to have that increased CO2 levels. Then that's more common in the later ones. Their AP chest diameter, so the anterior posterior diameter of the chest. There's something called barrel chest, and we'll get into that when we talk about emphysema. But with chronic bronchitis, they do not have an increase in their AP diameter. With emphysema, they do. With chronic bronchitis, they don't. They do not have an increased AP diameter with chronic bronchitis. Um, so that's where there's so much air trapping that their AP diameter of their chest wall actually is more enlarged. And so that's something that happens with recurrent air trapping that doesn't get resolved. So that would be more like emphysema. With chronic bronchitis, hey, three months during the sick part of the year, and then it resolves, right? So on and so forth. So that's what we're looking at here. Their AP just chest diameter is normal with chronic bronchitis, not normal with emphysema. Hopefully you got that down. Core pulmonale, core pulmonale is right-sided heart failure. One of the bedside ways of seeing if someone has core pulmonale, and it's not an exact science, but it's just something that could hint towards it, would be looking for jugular venous distension, right? And hopefully you guys talked about this in patient assessment. If not, you have the internet at your resource here. So jugular venous distension is a sign that there's not enough blood being emptied or squeezing, squeezing, squeezed into the lungs and ultimately circulated. That means the right side of the heart is not getting rid of the blood that's in it. There's a backup. The right pump is failing. And if that pump is failing, just like anything else in plumb, in the plumbing world, if that right heart ventricle is that pump is not, is failing, then that means there's going to be a backup to everything behind it. And that includes, includes the superior vena cava, uh, which would include, which would increase jugular venous distension. Uh, you might also see pedal edema on these patients as well, where it's around their feet and ankles, just like you might see with heart failure, um, left side of heart failure as well. So that's where the peripheral edema comes from. If that right pump is not working, then everything behind it is going to back up. And both of those, the, the inferior vena cava and the superior vena cava, which is what the JVD jugular vein uh, drains into the superior vena cava, both of those will have a backup of pressure. That's why you'd see the edema in both the, the body as well as the JVD. Uh, percussion note, if you're doing diagnostic uh, percussion on them, uh, tapping on their chest wall, it's going to be a normal note. It's not going to be hyper resident uh, like you would see in emphysema. It's going to be a normal percussion note. Now, if they have a massive amount of inflammation, it could be towards the dull side, but we're just looking at, just in general here, probably a normal percussion note. Bedside evaluation, uh, their vital signs, if you just go ahead, let's say they show up to the emergency room, they're hypoxic, they're coughing up lots of sputum, uh, and you get a basic vital sign on them, all right? So let's talk about that whole situation. So imagine yourself working in an emergency room. You have your stethoscope on, you're wearing your Pima scrubs, right? You have your vital signs. Uh, this patient comes in, hypoxic, working hard to breathe, coughing up lots of thick sputum, sticky sputum. They're smoker. Right, you grab vital signs on them. Usually they're going to have pretty normal values on their baseline. They're not going to have lots of interesting things if they don't have an infection going on. But when they do have an infection, which is the mental area where I wanted you to go just a second ago, right? This is where you would see all this stuff here. Um, so you got that patient coming in, coughing up thick sticky sputum, hypoxic, working hard to breathe. That's what you're going to see here, right? You're going to see their heart rate's going to be fast. 
They're going to be breathing fast, right, tachypnea. They're going to be hypoxic, which is what we talked about there. So that's that blue bloater, that cyanosis going on. You might see digital clubbing. Now, this is not them showing you a video of them dancing to electronic dance music at some sort of local club. This is their fingers uh, having swollen, pretty much the swollen fingertips out there. And you can Google image this, uh, digital clubbing, and you can see that their fingers, the tips of their fingers are enlarged, like they're like like ankle edema only, but on your fingers. It's pretty crazy. So digital clubbing, something different than the dance scene. I'm just saying. And then hepatomegaly, that's that large liver. Now remember, uh, the liver. Um, is what will also be backed up. Uh, blood will be backed up if that right side of the heart is failing. Uh, then the liver will also have blood that backs up into it. That's a sign of right-sided heart failure or something that can happen with right-sided heart failure. So that patient that's coming in, that ER patient that's coming in with thick, sticky sputum, hypoxic, this is what they're going to look like. They're going to be in that exacerbation phase. Now let's say it's in the middle of summertime. They stop smoking for some reason. Uh, they've been taking their inhalers, their corticosteroid inhalers, and they're back to pretty much reversed base, back to a normal level. That baseline, when they have everything under control, everything's going to look normal on them. Their vital signs should be normal. So when they go into their doctor visit, which they should be going to, they go into their doctor visit here, everything's going to look normal. Their vital signs, the heart rate will be fine. The respiratory rate will be fine. Their pulse ox will look fine. Their fingers and toes and all those things may not have edema going on. Their liver may be palpated okay and not have any large largeness noted, <laughs> have any significant size noted. So at baseline, uh, if everything's under control, everything looks great. But under exacerbation, this is what you're going to be seeing. So this is something I would pay attention to is that exacerbation sign. X-ray, yay! And I know there was all three of you that watched my X-ray uh, video. So if you want to, go back and look at it. Uh, X-ray is going to be congested. So there's a fancy word called infiltration that they like to use on X-ray. And that means there's something that's opaque that's there that's infiltrating it, right, in the lung fields. Well, that could be either mucus. It could be a foreign object. It could be a liquid. It could be swollen tissue. So they don't know what it is, and so they call it an infiltrate because something's there. But on an x-ray, you can't tell exactly if it's swelling versus mucus or so on, right? So they'll say those infiltration. So there's going to be more radio opaque. It's going to be more uh, white appearing on their x-ray. Uh, you'll see multiple densities. That's that more radio opacities that you'll be seeing. So radiolucency from hyperinflation is going to be in the distal airways, and I have examples, and we're going to look at this. So that's going to be in your peripheral airways when you look at sort of the borders. Uh, bronchiovascular markings, uh, that's from the swollen airways. Enlarged right side of the heart, this is going to be more like it's a during an exacerbation. Um, enlarged right side of the heart, which means if you're looking at like the heel of a boot, it's going to be like the heel is going to be bigger if you're looking at the heart, the left ventricle being the toe of a boot, and the right ventricle being the heel, that heel is going to look larger. Uh, what's right side of heart failure called again? Hopefully you know, we've gone over it. Uh, and then finally, you'll have depressed or flattened diaphragms. Now, the depressed or flattened diaphragms means that the diaphragms, the left and right hemidiaphragm, are going to be, instead of being nice and curved and have a good costophrenic angle that's going on, they're going to be hyperinflated, and then you're going to have that sort of column look to them where instead of that curve, They're flattened. So that diaphragm is chronically enlarged because there's some air trapping going on there. So this is what you're looking at here. This is the x-ray. So if we do the A through I technique, which I know a couple of you <laughs> looked at, uh, A is for apices. So we're going to look at the apices. I see a lot of radio opacity. Nope. I see a lot of radio lucency. Yes, I did that on purpose. Yeah, you can see up here how dark it is. You can see down here how dark it is. Radiolucent means it's dark. Radiopaque means it's light or white. So just like the the heart um, or in the abdomen here, like here would be the liver. 
let's make it red. Uh, the liver would be more dense and therefore more radio opaque, all right, and more white appearing. Um, so here you see uh, apices, we see radio lucency more than normal because do you see that in the middle areas of the lung fields? Absolutely not. So that's that radio lucency up there. So that means a sign of hyper inflation. So we see signs of hyperinflation in the apices. B is for bases. Um, so the costophrenic angle down here, we have a costophrenic angle, but what do you notice? This angle is more flat, right? So that means the diaphragms are moved down, right? So that's that hyperinflation that's pushing the diaphragms flatter. And you'll see that with emphysema too, right? You'll see that with uh, exacerbation of asthma. So these are all things that would deplat flatten or depress the diaphragm because there's hyperinflation it's pushing the diaphragms flatter or more open so that's why the diaphragms look flatter um, on their x-rays a b c d so um, c is cardiac notice that this is their their heart over here and this patient's rotated a little bit so that's why the heart's not as much in the left side as it could be but notice with these copd x-rays these obstructive x-rays the heart looks tall thin and narrow but what do you notice on here that heart on the right side the patient's right side is a little bit larger so remember i was talking about like a boot the toe would be over on the left side and the heel would be over on the right side over here so you would see an enlarged heel and so you can see a little bit of that here as well abcd diaphragm hyperinflated so one two three four five six seven eight nine ten almost eleven ribs uh so that's definitely hyperinflation abcd e it's esophagus no feeding tube f is for fissures don't see any fissures g is for gastric don't see any gastric uh h hilum lots of hy hilar infiltration probably an infection going on in eyes of interstitium right uh, so you see a lot of stuff going on here uh, a b c d f g h so we see the hyperinflation we see the radio opacities right especially in the hyalur spaces over here so it's that vascular congestion so we see hyperinflation we see mucus swelling right you can see as you see all these little lines here these are all lines that look at um, things like mucus going on plugging things like that so you can see all these lines and I wish I could just outline them all but the more you look at these the better you'll get so don't be discouraged if you can't see them right away just keep looking keep trying and looking eventually you'll get it there but when we're looking at here all these lines are signs of inflammation and edema and swelling they're called infiltrates because we don't know if it's mucus versus swelling right so that's that increased infiltration so we have an increased infiltration in the middle areas we have hyperinflation or apices in our bases and then we have that enlarged right side of the heart and it's very hard here the heart is tall and narrow why is the heart tall and narrow on these obstructive processes remember the lungs and the heart are sharing a thoracic space so the more space the lungs take up the less room there is for the heart so the more hyperinflated someone is that means the area the heart has is being squeezed which means the heart's not able to squeeze as much which also means things like the vena cava superior and inferior vena cava are also being squeezed now remember superior and inferior vena cava they're not a muscle so guess what's going to be cut off first the superior and inferior vena cava before the muscle that is the heart so more likely you'll see the edema in the jvd before you'll see hemodynamic issues Here's another picture from your book. I like this one because it actually shows that mucus uh, duct accumulation as well in these patients. And these are air bronchograms. So these are air pockets, which usually the significance of an air bronchogram means, and you can see the air pocket here, uh, air pocket here, air pocket here. Hopefully you guys can see everything that I'm sort of circling here. But these uh, air bronchogram means there's an air pocket. And it usually means there's a pocket of air. And it's either surrounded by uh, tissue 
like there's swelling going on and there's just an air pocket or it's a, a pocket of gas or a gas bubble inside a bunch of mucus right and so what do you notice about these patients well they have lots of inflammation and they have lots of mucus right so that's what you're seeing here and so you can see how radio opaque this whole thing is and how much the airways are just clogged and bogged down by all this right you can see it very well especially down here and hopefully this is real life here you guys can see this there's another air bronchogram right there um, so when you're looking at these, notice that there's a lot of mucus going on with these patients. So airway clearance therapy is going to be an important part of their process. All right, so let's talk about a chronic bronchitis pulmonary function test. So let's say you got a patient, they suspect they have chronic bronchitis, they do the x-ray, it looks like chronic bronchitis. And the physician wants to see, okay, how bad is their chronic bronchitis, right? How bad is their obstructive process of chronic bronchitis? So the physician orders a pulmonary function test. To which, what would you see, right? And the cornerstone of diagnostic evaluation in these patients or how severe they are is going to be the pulmonary function test. So remember when I talked about earlier, like when you're looking at a blood gas, you label like the CO2, is it increased, decreased, normal, right? Uh, or is it acidic or is it basic or is it normal, right? So when you're looking at these, if you're still getting used to PFTs, I still recommend labeling the FEV1 to FBC, right? That's your FEV1%. And so this is a flow rate right so that's where you need to go through and label these um, so when you're looking at flow rates the peak expiratory flow rate that's a flow rate as well right uh, 25 to 75 that's a flow rate as well so don't hesitate to do that uh, initially until you get it down uh, like I said repetition is the key to learning so the more you do it the more it'll be sort of ingrained in you so then one day you'll be looking at this and be like oh these are their flow rates these are volumes right so that's one of the things that you're looking at with these patients um, so when you're looking at the FEV1 the FEV1 is going to tell you how much volume they can breathe out in that first second so the force vital capacity and the FEV1 are all going to be decreased. Uh, the force vital capacity would be decreased overall. Why do you think the forced vital capacity would be decreased? Right, because it's forced. Um, so you're going to have gas that can trap in there. If they're during, if they have obstructive process going on. That's exactly what would be going on. Now, if we did a slow vital capacity, then the slow vital capacity might be either normal, right? But the force vital capacity could be decreased. So force vital capacity um, is going to be decreased if there's an obstructive process going on. And this is all in your book, right? I'm not doing anything that's not in your book um, here. And so when you're looking at vital capacity versus force vital capacity understand if there's a question mark of an obstructive process do a slow vital capacity as well that way you'll be able to determine that there's not a mixed issue going on fev1 to fbc ratio of course will be decreased peak expiratory flow rate of course is going to be decreased the FEF 25 to 75%, which is looking at the sort of that mid to small airways, uh, is very, very low in things like emphysema, asthma. Well, in this case, also, you're going to have a low 25 to 75 as well. Uh, 200 to 1200. Um, it can be low, usually it's normal. So we'll just say normal to low. Uh, MVV for these patients, when we're looking at the MVV, that's the overall respiratory function, which if, is their respiratory function doing well? No. <laughs> and then the DLCO, that's the diffusion, right? How easy it is to get from the, the alveoli into the bloodstream. And so with these patients with a massive amount of inflammation going on, 
their DLCO would be guesses. No one guessing. Their DLCO would be normal. In some cases, it might actually be increased, but let's just say normal for the sake of clarity here. Um, the DLCO is going to be normal in this case. Um, the only time, only obstructive disease that you have that's going to have a low DLCO is emphysema. I will repeat that again. The only obstructive disease you have, and this is it just in general, the only obstructive disease you have that's going to have a low DLCO would be emphysema because the destruction of the surface area of the tissues. Um, so if you do a PFT, a complete PFT on someone, and their DLCO is normal, then odds are they may not have emphysema. They might have one of the other obstructive components, but they won't have emphysema. All right, there are different volumes and capacities. So this is us looking at that volume and capacity box, which you all sh should have memorized by now. And then let's do one that's 50-50. So that's what we're looking at here. If we were to look at their volumes and capacities, what would they be? So their IRV, their tidal volume, so on and so forth. So when we're looking at this, um, their inspiratory capacity is going to be decreased. Um, so I know this is sort of out of order. So the inspiratory capacity is going to be decreased. Their FRC will be increased because of all the gas trapping. Total lung capacity on these patients are going to be increased, right? Because they have air that's being trapped in their lungs. Their vital capacity will either be decreased or normal. So this is looking at like a slow vital capacity or a forced vital capacity. That's why it's either decreased, forced, or normal, which would be uh, if they did a slow vital capacity. So decreased if it's a forced, normal if it's a slow vital capacity. Um, so we're looking at that. Uh, their tidal volume would be increased Increased tidal volume. That's them trying to take a deeper breath to compensate. The residual volume is going to be increased. Their expiratory reserve volume is going to be decreased. And this is because their residual volume is increasing. So we got the residual volume and the ERV. So the, the amount that they can forcefully exhale decreases because the gas is trapped. And so mo instead of the ability to get it out, they don't have as much ability to get it out because of the air trapping. So that's why the ERV decreases and the RV increases. All right, overall, this is called FRC. And the FRC on obstructive diseases usually increases because there's more gas that's just trapped and stuck in the lungs. And then the IRV, when we're looking at the inspiratory capacity in the IRV, uh, that's going to be decreased overall. So we'll have to go over this again and again. With each one of these diseases, we'll go over this again. The big thing here is that there's so much gas being trapped that the lower part, all the residual volumes and reserve volumes, all these residual volumes are going to increase because gas cannot get out. The expiratory side cannot happen. So that expiratory side decreases. Inspiratory side, the IRV decreases as well and tidal volume increases. So that what we're looking at here is their bank account. They can't tap into their savings account, which would be their expiratory, right? They can't tap into their expiratory. Right, they can't tap into this. They they're using their inspiratory bank account because there's so much air trapping that they have to breathe at a higher lung volume level than normal. So that's going to encroach on their inspiratory bank account, and therefore their tidal volume is going to be taking up that larger part in there. 
All right, an ABG with chronic bronchitis. So this is the mild to moderate stages. You're going to have a respiratory alkalosis. And most of these processes, if you take a wild guess and what it's going to look like in an acute mild stage or an acute moderate stage, guess alkalosis, right? You'll probably be correct. Because what's the body's response to hypoxemia? You're going to breathe faster right and as you breathe faster what happens to your blood gas you should be more alkalotic right so that's that response to that decreased oxygen level you're gonna be like hypoxemia i gotta breathe faster and get rid of this right and so i can get more oxygen into my bloodstream that's the whole alveolar air equation if i can get rid of uh i can get more oxygen into my bloodstream if i get rid of co2 Right. And so in most of these obstructive diseases, and we'll go through them all, if you have to guess, uh, guess more on the alkalosis for that mild to moderate stage. When we see that acidosis, that's when we start to see big issues start to appear in the severe late stages there. So if you draw blood gas on our patient, remember that patient I talked about, lots of mucus, thick sticky mucus, hypoxic, cyanotic, coming into the hospital and you draw blood gas. Uh, if you see an alkalosis, be thankful because that's a mild, moderate stage. If you see an acidosis, that's a severe stage, right? That means they've gone into respiratory fatigue at that point. Um, so that's what you're looking at here. Initially, you're going to see uh, an acute respiratory alkalosis with mild to moderate hypoxemia. When you're looking at this on the right, this all has to do with the oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve. Yes. It's coming back again for a third class with me. All right, so here on the, remember the flat part of the curve, until once you have a PO2 of 60 and above, you're in that sort of green zone. You're in that sort of healthy area where your saturation should be above 90%. You should still be able to get oxygen to your vital organs, which your heart would be the important one, heart and brain, kidneys, all those important organs. Um, and once you hit a PO2 of 60, now remember going over this at the end part of pulmonary AMP, that's when your peripheral chemoreceptors, right, your peripheral chemoreceptors start to kick in and be like, oh, so my central chemoreceptors are not doing the job and now we've hit a PO2 of 60. Now I need to bring up my backup. My backup is my peripheral chemoreceptors. And they're going to kick in and they're going to try to tell the patient to hyperventilate, breathe faster, right? So they're hypoxic, right? Hypoxemic. And then once they hit that point of hypoxemia, it's going to tell them to breathe faster so that breathing faster gets rid of co2 which should help their po2 level off so they shouldn't have any more drops in their po2 that'll help save their brain help save their heart help save their kidneys all that stuff because they're breathing faster what happens to the level of co2 right their co2 drops and that's what you're seeing here their co2 is going to decrease so that's why when you see a patient that's starting into their hypoxic phase that hypoxemia phase, they're going to be tachypnic. And when you see, see that tachypnea, odds are, unless they've had it going on for a prolonged period of time, they're going to be in a respiratory alkalosis. And I hope this makes sense. So as the PO2 gets worse, they're going to increase their respiratory rate. That respiratory rate's to help get more oxygen to the bloodstream. As we breathe faster, as we breathe deeper, that's going to cause their CO2 levels to drop. So that's why in the acute, mild, moderate stages, you're going to have a respiratory alkalosis, right? This is going to be part of what you're putting on your chart. So what happens if this goes on? Well, this is what we're looking at, the alveolar hyperventilation stage on the right here. So we're looking at this middle section here. So this is great. Their CO2 is going down. Their PO2 is leveling off. This is great. We're compensating, compensating, compensating. Their PO2s are great. Their CO2 is going down, and that's allowing for more oxygen to get into the bloodstream. This is great, but can we keep this up? No. <laughs> so not for a very, very prolonged period of time. So that's why in the later severe stages, 
you might see either a compensated respiratory acidosis, um, uh, you might see a compensated respiratory acidosis with mild to moderate hypoxemia. So what's going to happen here is this is only going to go on for a little bit of time until they reach sort of a fatigue. So when their respiratory muscles, which are all skeletal, right, the diaphragm skeletal muscle is fatigued, then they're not going to be able to hyperventilate anymore. So they're going to be in this chronic ventilatory failure. So their CO2 levels are going to start to climb. Well, Dalton's law says you can't have everything, right? If your CO2 levels are starting to climb because you can't breathe as much as deep as fast anymore, that means because of Dalton's law, there's only so much room if this CO2 level is increasing. That means the oxygen level will be decreasing, right? It's the payoff. If they start to go into respiratory fatigue and respiratory failure, the CO2 levels are going to climb, and that means that their PO2 levels will then start to fall. So if you draw a blood gas on this patient and their CO2 levels are normal or increased, odds are that PO2, PO2 is decreased. All right, this is just normal physiology for something that's going on. So be aware of something called impending respiratory failure. So impending respiratory failure, what do I mean by that? So let's go back to that patient picture we talked about before. Someone comes in coughing up thick, sticky mucus, breathing fast, their heart rate's fast, right? They're cyanotic, you put oxygen on them, you're drawing a blood gas to see how severe their condition are. You cannot do a PFT on them right now, right? Because they're so sick. Um, but you draw blood gas to sort of see where they're at or how severe their process is in the emergency department. And you see a normal blood gas. Let's say the pH is 7.35. All right, here, let me, let me write it out. Let's say their pH is 7.35. Let's say their CO2 is... 40. Let's go with a perfect CO2. Um, let's see that their PO2 is, I don't know, 50. And then we'll just say their bicarb is 26. Um, so when we're looking at this blood gas, uh, you see a pretty much almost normal blood gas with hypoxemia, right? 7.35 is normal. CO2 of 40 is normal right 26 normal uh, except for the po2 part but you're looking at that and you're like well their blood gas is normal they're all within normal limits but this patient's working hard to breathe they're sweaty they're coughing up thick mucus they're they're they don't look as healthy as their blood gas looks well what you're seeing here is that switch over from when their blood gas was in a respiratory alkalosis to now it's trending towards a respiratory acidosis right so this is the part where their respiratory muscles got fatigued and now they're starting to increase the co2 level let's say previously you drew a blood gas and their co2 level is 25 now they fatigued and now their co2 level is 40 that means that they're going to respiratory fatigue so that's why they call this impending respiratory failure so if you draw a blood gas on a patient that looks super sick and it's normal <laughs> that's a sign of impending respiratory failure right so look at your patient do they look like they're working hard to breathe do they are they tachypnic tachycardic are they working hard to breathe coughing up lots of thick mucus and you draw blood gas and it's normal that's not a good sign that means that they're going towards ventilatory failure right uh, and so that means we need to take intervention because they're going into respiratory they've gone into respiratory fatigue uh, and if they continue this they can go into what's called acute respiratory failure which means now we draw the blood gas and let's just say it's 720 and a co2 of 60 right so that would be acute uh, uh, respiratory failure at that point so be aware of impending respiratory failure if you get a normal looking blood gas on a patient that's not normal looking that's a bad sign right that's why you can't go by just looking at the blood gas and be like oh they'll be fine right if the rest of them looks terrible that's actually a sign that you should be paying attention to that so the difference between uh, the two would be one has a normal blood gas, obviously hypoxic. Uh, the other one is uh, the pH is acidic, the CO2 is acidic. 
So that's something that you have to look out for on these patients. So normal blood gas on an abnormal patient, not good, just in general. Oh, heavens, what are we looking at here? Oxygenation, I like this one. Oxygenation, so this is looking at different things that we uh, see with these patients. And so is this patient shunting? Do we have blood that's going from the right side of the heart to the left side of the heart, right? We don't have an uh, anatomical shunt. But do we have blood that's going through the lungs that does not exchange CO2 and O2? Do we have that going on? Well, absolutely, right? Absolutely, we got a shunt going on. So we have blood that's going through the lungs that's not able to get rid of CO2. Remember, their lungs aren't able to exhale or get rid of that CO2 in that severe stage, right? We talked about that respiratory fatigue, respiratory failure stage. So that CO2 uh, is not able to get out of their lungs. That air trapping is causing the ability for the lungs not to get rid of that CO2. That means oxygen won't get into the blood. So we have more deoxygenated blood going from the right side to the left side. This is a shunt. Shunt is perfusion without ventilation. In other words, we have blood flowing to the lungs. And that blood, that high CO2 blood, does not exchange any gas and just sort of continues on, right? That's a shunt. We have perfusion without ventilation, right? Uh, so that's going to be a very, very hard thing to look at. There's an increase in shunting on those patients. So therapeutically, what do you do when a patient has a shunt? Uh, now, this is a non-anatomic shunt, um, so that means that they'll respond to oxygen, so you're going to give them high-flow oxygen therapy. So that means increase FiO2. Therapeutically, uh, DO2 is going to be decreased. So DO2, as you guys remember, which I'm sure you all remember off the top of your heads, is the delivery of oxygen. This is looking at your cardiac output and your CO2, right? Uh, so the DO2 is actually decreased because is there their cardiac output, um, assuming hemodynamic stability, the cardiac output, let's just say, is normal, but their ability to get oxygen inside their um, their bloodstream is decreased, right? We have a big impeding uh, ability to get oxygen in because we got CO2 that's staying in there. So their CaO2 is going to be decreased. So if I decrease CaO2, and let's just say my cardiac output stays normal, let's just say there are heart is not in any sort of heart failure. Let's just say my CaO2 decreases, but my cardiac output is normal. Well, that means my DO2 is going to be decreased. My delivery of oxygen to my tissues is going to be decreased with chronic bronchitis, which is the hypoxia part, right? That's why their kidneys will sense reduced oxygen and start to produce erythropoietin. That's why we'll, you can see polycythemia with these chronic patients. Uh, VO2, which is oxygen consumption. When we're looking at VO2 on these patients, that's how much it consumes over um, when it's delivered. And when you're looking at consumption, uh, there there's nothing really that changes with their metabolic rate. And so their, their VO2, their oxygen consumption, is going to be normal. Normal. Their oxygen extraction ratio, or how much the tissues take away, is actually going to be increased. Now, why is this increased in the consumption normal? Well, the oxygen extraction ratio is increased because the DO2 is decreased. Remember, so let's say I have a bank account, and I have $20 in that bank account. Every time I go into the bank, I'm going to withdraw five dollars from this twenty dollar bank account so this means I have fifteen dollars left over so that's my extraction ratio my extraction is going to be five dollars now let's say my delivery or how much is in my bank account is ten dollars so I'm not getting as much into my bank account but my extraction is the same I'm I haven't changed how much I'm taking out I'm going to take out five dollars well my extraction ratio, or how much of what I took out, 
increased, right? I increased based upon what I have in that account. I've taken out way more than what I have previously. So the extraction ratio is increased. Well, this is increased because the DO2 is low. That's what we're looking at here. Hopefully this makes sense, and I'm not turning you guys into bankers instead of respiratory therapists. But that's what you're seeing with the O2ER. The O2ER is decreased, not because of metabolic rate, not because of tissue demand, but because our DO2 is low to begin with. Our bank account was low to begin with. So it's not because of the demand part. We're taking out the same amount as we were before. We just started off with a lower savings account here. Uh, the A to V gradient, and this is sort of looking at metabolic demand, the C A to V gradient, uh, that's going to be normal. This is really not a high metabolic condition, so the A to V gradient is going to be normal when you're looking at this one. Uh, things like the cardiac output are going to be normal because they're compensating with tachycardia. Oh yeah, here's the hemodynamics. So CVP, central venous pressure, so... As we know, there's a big backup of fluid, especially with the hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, right? Pulmonary vasoconstriction causes a backup of pressure, which means that CVP, central venous pressure, would be increased, which, hey, if there's a pulmonary vasoconstriction, the pulmonary artery, which leads up to that area, is going to have a backup of blood, too, which means the pulmonary artery pressure is also going to be increased right pulmonary vascular resistance or how much how easy it is for blood to flow through the lungs well we know that the pulmonaries uh capillaries are constricted because of the high co2 and low oxygen so pulmonary vascular resistance is increased as well uh pulmonary capillary wedge pressure looks at the left side of the heart so when we're looking at this has the unless the patient already has heart failure on top left side of heart failure or chf on top of this um the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure should be normal right so we're talking a person with just chronic bronchitis the left side of the heart should be functioned normally now are there patients that have chronic bronchitis and congestive heart failure absolutely but just in general for now right we're just looking at chronic bronchitis by itself their wedge pressure is going to be normal. Remember, the wedge pressure tells us how healthy the left pump is, how healthy that left ventricular pump is. Uh, their cardiac output, we already talked about this, is going to be normal. They're trying to increase their cardiac output because the hypoxemia, so they're trying to get more blood to flow through the lungs, tachycardia, right? Uh, to pick up, if I send more red blood cells to my lungs, therefore I should get more oxygen, right? So the cardiac output uh, should be normal ultimately with this. Uh, because they can't squeeze it as well with the right-sided heart failure, they're going to increase the rate. So you'll see that tachycardia. A lab test on these patients. Uh, one of the first ones that you'll look at with chronic bronchitis is polycythemia you'll see this on the cbc remember the cbc looks at their um red blood cells white blood cells hemoglobin uh, platelets all that stuff so uh you'll see the polycythemia or increased number of red blood cells that's good that it, it's good in the sense that it's compensating there's a compensatory mechanism that's allowing them to get better oxygen to delivery to their tissues right so it's not good in a sense that they're severe enough to have polycythemia but it's good that their body has comp helped compensate for that hypochloremia is very common with patients in general that have chronic ventilatory failure so you might see hypochloremia with uh, copd as well just regular uh, emphysema um, so you might see that as well with patients that have just chronic vent failure that hypochloremia and we can talk about that later hypernatremia so high sodium uh, very common with these hypochloremia patients as well uh, sputum culture may show and then that's what we're looking at here abnormal things like strep h flu right and however you pronounce this guy so when we're looking at this uh odds are they have some sort of infection going on because these patients have chronic irritation because that mucus is stuck in that warm 
uh, humid, dark environment, their their lungs can culture things, and usually they'll come in with an infection, not because their smoking got bad, but because there's, their chronic bronchitis got to the point where they could not clear these things out of their lungs that they normally would, and that's what you're seeing. Therapeutic, okay, so what do we do? We got this person, they have chronic bronchitis, they have massive amount of infiltration, you can see on these patients that have hyperinflation, um, this person also has heart failure. You can see how large that left side, but you can see the right side is pretty large too. Uh, this person also had a previous heart surgery. You can see the sternum sutures. Um, so when we're looking at this um, situation, one of the first things we can do for these patients, uh, smoking cessation, if we can. If we can get them to stop smoking, that will help make their cilia be more effective because remember, cigarette smoke, actually paralyzes cilia. And now they don't have the ability to clear secretions, therefore their secretions get more numerous and sticky. Not only that, but now they're throwing tar and uh, other things into the lungs with smoke uh, that will cause more and more secretions. So one of the first things that they can do to ultimately be better and get better, uh, smoking cessation, not sensation, but cessation. Stop it, stop smoking. Uh, smoking prevention is going to be the biggest thing, uh, most effective in like third graders, ultimately, uh, in children. When we talk about smoking prevention, if the the easiest way to stop smoking is to never start. And so that's one of the things that we've done at Children's Health Fairs is actually doing a smoking prevention talk where we have the smoked pig lungs and the unsmoked pig lungs. And we talk about this to kids, and that's just not something that they want to do. And so we talked about how gross these things ultimately are. So if we can get them sort of deciding how gross this thing actually is, maybe that's something we can prevent down the world. Down, down, ultimately in this this patient population, just get get uh, get a reduced uh, chronic bronchitis population. Occupational exposure, in other words, if they work in a, in a condition where they're chronically exposed to things um, like they say they work in uh, woodworking and there's dust all over the place and they don't wear a mask they work with diesel engines and there's diesel fumes and or they work in metals and there's metal that's flying all over the place or they work in a place where there's lots of cigarette smoke around them all right so we got to look at their occupational exposure the pollution all those things that are around them uh, we have to look at limiting that to these patients have and having them wear a mask is something that is difficult too because now you're obstructing gas from flowing into and out of their mouth and nose so it's something we got to be careful with here so the pollution and the occupational exposure they got to be aware and there's things um that that can actually tell them the amount of pollution that's in the outdoor air advisories, right? You know, in the Colorado, they have that where they'll tell you um, what the pollution is for that day, or the, they have a pollution advisory, right? Which can then tell people that have lung issues to probably stay out of that because that could cause their, their chronic bronchitis or their asthma to be triggered or exacerbated. Uh, physical activity is also going to be something that's very helpful for them when these patients are walking around, when these patients are physically active, whether it's in a pool, which is very, very evidence-based for these type of COPD patients overall. Um, that's going to be something that increases ciliary activity. That's going to be something that increases their ability to clear secretions. It's going to be something that helps them actually get better. And I used to tell the physical therapist they would do more for my patient's lungs than I would by giving them the breathing treatment because they're getting them up. They're walking them down the hallway. They're walking them up the stairs. They're getting them to move. And that's all going to help clear those lungs out. And hopefully you guys get a good chance to do some pulmonary rehab with um, uh, down the road here. And pulmonary rehab is a big, big thing, especially with COPD. Big thing. And so that's something that we have to look at there. And then finally, drugs. And that's what we're going to look at on the next slide. So drugs that we'll use include bronchodilators. Bronchodilators now, remember, part of this could be bronchospasm, so that would help with their bronchospasm. But let's say they don't have reactive airways to bronchospasm. Could this still help? Absolutely, having a bronchodilator, because it also increases cilia motility. Yes.
It's all about airway clearance. A lot of this is airway clearance with these guys. So next time you see a pneumonia patient or when you guys go out to clinicals, you see a person with pneumonia that has uh, lots of secretions or the potential for lots of secretions in their airways, and they give them a bronchodilator and they don't have any uh, bronchospasm issues, uh, they're doing it because they want to have improved airway clearance, right? That's why they're doing it, but that's a whole separate thing. Inhaled corticosteroids, of course, if there's inflammation going on in the airway. So inhale corticosteroids, insert corticosteroid here, whether it's the nebulizer uh, or any of the uh, inhalers that include uh, a, a steroid, like I talked about, QVAR, Simcort, uh, they have the triple therapy ones now, the dual therapies. Um, the, the, the QVAR and the Flovent are the ones that I'm more common with um, because they're just the single steroid in there. They're not combined with the lava or saba or anything like that. So combination ones, we talked about that. Long-term oral corticosteroids, if it's a severe enough exacerbation, they can give them prednisone. Those are those tablets. Um, they can do solumedrol, which is an IV one, which is a prodrug, actually, uh, uh, as well. And I believe the oral prednisone is also a prodrug. You guys will have to confirm that too for me as well. Uh, PDIs, methyl xanthines, not as much evidence here. Um, can you use these. Uh, xanthines increase your respiratory drive. Remember one of the things that they talked about was the decreased respiratory drive. Remember, a xanthine increases your drive, so this is like caffeine, right? <laughs> increases your respiratory drive. So they could give, uh, the patient could drink caffeine, but uh, they could give them um, an aminophilin or theophilin in theory. Not as much evidence. The mode of action, remember, on xanthines is unknown, so it's one of those things that they may, may not. It's not one of the first line therapies for it. Other things, make sure these patients have their vaccinations, they have their flu shots, things like that. Because remember, they're more prone to infection, and that's something that we got to be worried about. Uh, antibiotics as needed. So that's all. if they show a culture that shows a bacterial pneumonia or bacterial infection, then maybe we use antibiotics for it. But if we get a sample and it just shows MRF, like mixed respiratory flora, you'll see that out there. If we get a sputum sample and it just shows mixed respiratory flora, it doesn't show anything that's cultured from them. Should we still give them antibiotics? No, because it hasn't grown anything yet. Um, so all as needed, that means we have to confirm there's something going on. Uh, mucolytic therapy, uh, this can be a number of things to thin out the secretions. One of the biggest things you can do to make sure a patient's secretions are thin is their hydration level. Are they drinking lots of water? All right. Uh, if they're giving them a diuretic, that can also make it hard for them to clear secretions, right? Because now we're decreasing the amount that's in there. So mucolytic therapy, making sure the patient's hydrated is going to be one of the biggest things out there. Um, but you can do uh, low-dose hypertonic NEBS. We can do sterile saline NEBS. Um, we can do uh, pulmazyme if it's purulent. Uh, remember, that's the one that breaks up pus, right? The DNA is in the pus. So pulmazyme. Um, so there's different things that we can do here uh, as far as mucolytic therapy goes. Interventions uh, as far as non-pharmacological therapies. Uh, pulmonary rehab is going to be one of your first ones. If they have chronic bronchitis, it's recurrent. We're worried about it causing issues. Pulmonary rehab can be really benefit these patients. It gets them moving, gets them confident, gets them educated. And there's multiple professions that are involved there. It's physical therapy, occupational therapy, uh, nutrition, respiratory therapy. So there's a bunch of benefits to pulmonary rehab. So I'm going to preach pulmonary rehab pretty strongly here. Uh, treatment care specialist, ultimately that's get, making sure they're educated on their disease, they're empowered. Empowering these patients is huge because you want them to stay active. You don't want them sitting in the chair and just growing and festering things. You want them to be empowered to be uh, part of their team. Uh, part of You want them to be part of the team that helps care for themselves. You don't want them uh, not knowing what's going on and then just sort of giving up because it looks overwhelming. Oxygen therapy is going to be one of the first things that we do for these patients, so we may be able to set them up for home oxygen as well. Uh, ventilatory support, this is more in the hospital. Uh, ventilatory support, or they might need nocturnal uh, non-invasive ventilation, right? Uh, they they might need some ventilatory support, especially if they have a normal blood gas and abnormal looking uh, patient presentation, or they might ha go into respiratory fatigue and failure, right? 
So they might need that ventilatory support. Uh, surgical treatments, this would include uh, getting rid of things that are uh, infections. Um, so they might have to do eventually like a lobectomy or put in those one-way valves like we see with emphysema, things like that. What's causing these issues? Uh, surgical treatments can also include, if it gets bad enough, they could even do, if I'm thinking right, they can still be a candidate for lung transplants and things like that. Um, treatment of comorbid conditions, uh, make sure there's something else that's not causing them. Well, let's say they're in heart failure. Let's say they do have congestive heart failure, right? And they, because they have congestive heart failure, they sort of sit around all day they don't move around so are they breathing deep are they walking around much if they if their heart's not functioning right so we need to start treating them for their comorbid conditions now remember half of patients that have copd also have congestive heart failure which means half of patients with congestive heart failure also have copd and so looking at comorbid conditions seeing if there's something that's causing this patient just to stay in fester is very very important so if we can get their comorbid comorbid conditions under control their diabetes uh, heart failure things like that that's going to really help them in the long run and then uh, the right types of care ultimately down the road that's more in the end of life conversations all right, review questions. I will not answer these for you because they are everything we've talked about. So if you are able to answer these questions off the top of your head, you are doing well. Congratulations. Uh, four common lung alterations that occur with chronic bronchitis. We went over this. This was actually one of the first slides we went over. Uh, I will tell you mucus glands and inflammation are a part of it. Hyperinflation, right? Bedside evaluation, right? What would you see? The patient shows up, they would they be hyperoxic? Would they be hypocapnic or hypercapnic? Uh, would they have jugular venous distension? Would they have edema? Would they have digital clubbing? Right? So these are all things that we've gone over. What would their breath sounds sound like? Right? These are all things we've gone over. So this is a review for you. What would be on their chest x-ray? Would it be radio opaque? Would it be radio lucent? Would it be both? What are some of the significant signs you would see on their x-ray? What would their vital signs be baseline? What would their vital signs be during an exacerbation? What would their ABG show if it was mild to moderate condition? What would it show if it was severe? What about their hemodynamics? Would this cause an increase or decrease in their left heart function? What about their right heart function? What about their CVP? What about their pulmonary artery pressure? Would those be increased or decreased? What would their PFT look like? What would their volumes, what would their flow rates look like? Is there anything abnormal about their sputum? Right? Is it just normal sputum or is it something that can culture and grow things? Are they known for just normal white mucus? Well, their lab tests show, right? Especially if it's chronic, especially if it happens with lots of hypoxemia, especially if it includes ventilatory failure. What could you see on their labs? Okay, if this patient shows up, the care team's asking, what would you do? What interventions would you use for this patient that has lots of issues going on currently? What are some therapies that could help them currently during this disease exacerbation? What would you recommend? What's supported, right? And finally, hey, what's this whole impending respiratory failure versus acute respiratory failure thing about? What is that? These are all things that you should be able to go over. I encourage you guys to go through these things. I encourage you to look at what is this patient going to look like when they show up? What is their x-ray going to look like? What does their ABG look like? What's going on with their hemodynamics? What's going on with their shunt, right? What would their PFT look like? What would their sputum look like? What would their lab test show? These are all going to help you. And I ask these on purpose not to be cruel. I ask you these on purpose because knowing these things are going to help you at the bedside. They're going to help you take care of that patient more effectively. They're going to help you be a better practitioner. 
and I want you guys to sort of go through these. That's why I have that list in Blackboard for you to start making so you understand the minute things, so you know what the ABG for chronic bronchitis looks like versus an ABG for emphysema, versus an ABG for Guillain-Barre, right, versus an ABG for sarcoidosis, right? I want you guys to start looking at all these things. These will help you put everything together and get you ready to go out there.